Change is inevitable. But we've now entered a period in human history that the rate of change is accelerating. What happens when the rate of change exceeds our capacity to adapt? Have we already reached or perhaps passed that point? Or in a language that we already use at St Paul's School, what is an education worth having in a world that is changing so quickly? Welcome to Accelerating Change, a conversation about the future. I'm Paul Browning, Headmaster at St Paul's School, and today I'm speaking with Paul Compton, CEO of Barclays Bank in New York. Well, Paul, it's a, it's a great pleasure to actually talk to you, but I guess listeners are probably thinking straight away, yeah, how does Paul Browning know Paul Compton, the CEO of Barclays Bank in New York? Gosh, he's well connected. Yeah, Paul, do you want to tell us a bit of your story? Like, how do we actually know each other? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So, um, so by way of background, Paul, I was uh, born and raised in, uh, in Brisbane, in, uh, in Astley, uh, on the, uh, the north side of Brisbane. Um, I uh, went to St Paul's. I started at St Paul's in 1977 and uh, graduated in uh, 1981, where the school overall was probably only 300, 350 pupils at that, uh, that time. Um, uh, following uh, St Paul's, I went on to uh, the University of Queensland where I did two degrees. I did a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of, uh, of Economics. Um, so that, that, and, would been, uh, that would have been unusual in those days to do two degrees. It was unusual, yeah. yeah. There wasn't sort of a combined uh, degree. You had to sort of literally do two degrees separately. You got credit for certain subjects, but I sort of had to go through the, the, the process of doing two completely separate degrees. Yeah. Um, and I... Um, uh, then I went and worked for Ernst & Young, the chartered accounting firm in Brisbane, um, became a chartered accountant, did what was called the professional year back in those days, became a chartered accountant, uh, worked there for about three and a half years before I put my hand up and said I wanted to do an international assignment. Uh, and uh, quite fortuitously, I thought they were going to send me to, to London, but quite fortuitously an opportunity came up to go to uh the New York office of Ernst & Young. So I was actually only supposed to go for uh, a year and a half, but I went and met what is now my wife. And um, we did come back to Brisbane briefly, but I've pretty well been in the United States pretty much for the last sort of 30 years. So uh, whilst I've been in the United States, I worked for JP Morgan for over 20 years. Um, and uh most recently, um, I've worked at uh, Barclays, where um, I joined Barclays as the COO of the company, then became the president of Barclays Bank, and now I'm the global head of uh, banking. Um, so, uh, so that's the that's the whistle stop tour of what's happened in the last fifty six years. <laughs> so, a pretty impressive career. So, congratulations to you, Paul. Because I know to downstairs on the on the honour board there, nineteen eighty one school captain Paul Compton. So, you left here as school captain Thank and you. and then have ended up in New York. So, congratulations to you, Paul. I guess. Thank you. One question I'm really fascinated about, and I'm sure our listeners are as well, is the contrast between Australia and America in terms of its approach to COVID. You know, what's it been like in New York and what's been the impact on business and the economy? Yeah, so look, um, New York went through some very dark periods uh, with the COVID pandemic. I mean, I think back to last March and April, where really the city just came to a grinding halt and people were just not going to work commerce stopped um you know just about all of the public transport in the city was shut down and you would look out your window back in those days sort of march april of 2020 and it was like something out of a science fiction movie even like in midtown manhattan yeah there was never just, sleeps no, the city that never right, sleeps just, just never, has slept the city that never sleeps was, was asleep and um uh and so that was a that was a very dark period um uh, and then then we sort of started to climb our way out of that through the summer, but then lapsed back into it during uh, during the winter. I'm very sort of knock on wood, happy to say now that the incidents, the new incidents in the city on a daily basis have dropped precipitously and the and the uh, the rollout of the vaccine is starting to get real traction to the point that as a fifty six year old, I will probably get that vaccine at some point in the next six weeks i would say um so they're really getting good momentum around that so you can sort of see a path out but 
It definitely, especially in that sort of second quarter of 2020, Paul had a very dire impact on the economy, uh, on unemployment, business, restaurants, just everything just stopped. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think one thing that did surprise a lot of us, you know, like I, as, as I mentioned earlier, I work at Barclays Bank. You know, we very, very quickly took 80,000 employees and had them all set up and working from home within the space of weeks. And that was everything from traders who were, you know, buying and selling securities from their lounge room to call centre operators who were talking to people who had credit card questions, uh, doing it all from their home. So it was really quite a remarkable feat the way that we um, moved to working from home. And then since then, the company of 80,000 people, we've probably really only had 10 to 15% of the staff back in the office and the company has functioned extremely well. In fact, the wholesale bank has set record revenue levels due to volatility and the appetite for uh, financing. So um, it's actually been really quite remarkable, the, the fact that we can get billion dollar IPOs done with everybody operating from uh, from home. Uh, in terms of the contrast to Brisbane, you know, um, Australia sort of, you know, from somebody sitting 10,000 miles away has taken a very, very conservative approach to, um, to, to COVID. And, you know, I've often joked with my sisters who will say, you know, there's been a case identified in Melbourne. <laughs> One case and Brisbane's closed <laughs> down. <laughs> you know, and they've shut down the city. I would say, look, Rob and I look out my window and there's like, you know, 15 people with COVID. It's just, it's, 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 it's really quite surreal, the difference in terms of the, yeah. the way in which the different countries have approached um, uh, the, the response. Um, uh, but it seems now that the Israelis are leading the world in terms of the way in which they've approached it and they, they're sort of completely reopening up their economy now, um, you know, with sort of COVID uh, in the rearview mirror. So um, it's really quite fascinating. Paul, we, we're talking about accelerating change uh, and we've entered a period in human history where change is obviously inevitable and just accelerating and, and our ability to keep up is, is really questionable. I'm interested, first of all, Barclays Bank, you know, this was a critical incident, a pandemic. Had Barclays actually considered that in its forward planning with this possibility? Yeah, so look, you know, we do do a great deal of resiliency planning on the company and you know, working through all sorts of different scenarios around liquidity crises and cyber incidents and uh, um, uh, fundamental sort of uh, technology challenges and data centres, etc. So there is a plethora of resiliency planning that's done. A pandemic is on the list, but there was it was not um, envisaged in anywhere near the scale and and severity that you know the world has been through so um uh you know i would say yes it was part of the resiliency playbook but you know we were not prepared for what actually happened I and mean, one of the some of the challenges we had were you know we relied very heavily on some third parties to provide call center capabilities in places like india and the philippines and some of those institutions like literally shut down overnight and so we really had to scramble to uh, be able to provide the appropriate level of service to, uh, to customers when, you know, one of your partners um, uh, is unable to continue to operate. And, and quite a different sort of circumstance to the GFC. And I, I guess in Australia, a lot of people are expecting a similar sort of result uh, from the pandemic. It's not been the case. We've been really lucky here. Unemployment is going down. The economy is actually yeah. bouncing back very quickly. It's, it's shown some resilience there. What, yeah. do you th what do you think Barclays have learned from this experience? What, what will stay the same? What will change? Uh, are there opportunities yeah. Yeah. that Barclays are going to grab hold of now? And, and what messages are there for the economy? And, and other people entering the workforce in general. Yeah, yeah. So look, I think the thing that, I think the pandemic has accelerated a number of trends in banking. So the most notable would be digitization. So we were already uh, moving our customers from using branches to sort of doing digital banking. We were uh, moving customers from calling call centers to sending queries through chatbots and other forms um, uh, of technology. Um, what the pandemic did was it's really accelerated the need for banking to become um, appropriately digitized uh, in the way in which we interact with uh, with our customers. And so 
that has been a big change. I think the the necessity to sort of have anywhere near the same number of branches servicing communities um, has reduced pretty significantly. So it sounds well. like fewer people will be employed by Barclays as a result? No, look, I think what you'll see, Paul, is you'll see a change in roles. So, yeah. you know, obviously the technology organisation is growing all the time. Um, mm. And uh, it is truly an arms race in banking. Um, staff that have traditionally worked in branches are getting redeployed into other forms of customer service. For example, you know, through the pandemic, obviously the two-legged customer um, uh, especially those that have sort of had financial difficulties as a result of the pandemic, have um, meant that uh, operations like collections and, and, and um, financial assistance have become incredibly busy. So we've been able to sort of redirect those resources from branches to things like financial assistance, which which is very good because, you know, we've been very loath to um, uh, reduce any resources through the course of the pandemic um, uh, and actually have sort of prided ourselves on redeploying resources to the greatest and highest need. Um, I think what gets really interesting, Paul, is um, as people come back to work, um, how much flexibility will there be in the new working arrangements? You know, it's sort of very clear mm. that people no longer need to go to work from nine to five, five days a week. Um, and so I think there'll be a much greater level of flexibility for people. Mm. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, you're also going to find that um, as people start to think about their sort of their, their, their work practices, um, people I think are going to. I think a lot of them have become very well set up to operate out of their home, um, and I think that will become a, a sort of a normal part of uh, doing business on a daily basis. That people will have that flexibility, and I think that's that's a very good thing. And certainly for me personally, last year was a great year in the sense I didn't have to travel as much. So I, I wasn't driving into the city for a meeting on a weekly basis. I wasn't traveling anywhere interstate. And I got a lot of time back. Uh, and that flexibility that you're talking about, people have got a lot of time yeah. back. So how they're going to use that time is going to be interesting. When computers were actually brought in in the 80s, we're going to have so much leisure time, but we actually filled it with work. Uh, are people going to become more productive, yeah. do you think, and work harder? Do you see you know, any changes yeah. in, the, in the way we interact with each other and socialise as a result well, of having you know, yeah, that look, opportunity think, to work from home? Yeah, look, I think um, you raised a very interesting point about... Um, uh, you know, the commute and what have you. I, like I, One of the things that I think we've all learned through this experience is you know, probably the amount of travel we were doing, the amount of business travel we were doing was excessive and that there's very little that can't be done through video conferencing and sort of doing sort of from a distance. Um, um, I'm, now, I'm now going to say something that sort of slightly contradicts that point, which is I do believe in conducting business um, there is no replacement for face-to-face -face contact when it comes to developing trust mm. and when it comes to teams developing the ability to collaborate. So I think what you'll find is um, there will be a lot less travel, travel. You will, however, need to bring teams together with yep. some frequency. And then I think you sort of surround that with a very high level of, uh, of flexibility. Um, but I do think business travel is going to very rapidly, um, uh, you know, sort of year on year, I think there'll be sort of nothing like what we would have done back in 2019, for example. AI is the other thing that uh, I guess people are all talking about when we're talking about change and what's ha happening yeah. there. AI and the impact yeah. on banking, is, is Barclays looking at that and, yeah. and what's yeah, happening in that we space? Do great, yeah, we do a great deal in, in AI. Um, and. This is, again, Paul, one of these phenomena that I would say was already happening and possibly yeah. the pandemic was just an accelerant of an existing trend. Um, and, you know, we use AI a lot in things like cybersecurity where, um, you know, we're sort of looking at patterns of data and, and sort of learning from patterns of data and looking for unusual behaviour. Um, and you sort of there are tools that you can use that, get very good um, uh, and increasingly um, efficient at identifying abnormal behaviour by people or by data that points to potentially um, cyber challenges. So, um, and there was also a lot of work being done on AI around what we refer to as chatbots, which are 
tools that can interact with customers uh, when customers are asking more basic questions like, what's my balance or where's the nearest branch to where I live? You can have chatbots sort of answer those questions and they they get better and better with uh, through AI with the frequency of um, uh, the questions that get asked. So what you're saying really is the shape of work is changing and COVID has accelerated the shape of work. Uh, flexibility, right. the impact of AI, uh, closing of branches, people then transitioning to different roles, having to reskill. You know, and there's a whole range of things that they need to learn to be able to adapt to that. So dispositions, yeah. so yeah. to speak, the ability to deal with ambiguity, uh, the ability to actually yeah. you know, change and adapt to, to different circumstances. And that kind of speaks into education, doesn't it? Like, uh, are we actually adequate? preparing our young people uh, what should we be focused on to actually support their their ability to actually enter a workforce and be this type of employee that you're talking about yeah so you know Paul one of the things that I would say is um, what we've really seen through the pandemic is an acceleration of what I would call the dispersed economy right so uh, if you sort of think about um, uh, what a company does in terms of its core offering the dispersed economy is really about taking that core offering and moving it directly to the consumer and cutting out the more traditional challenge, the more traditional uh, channels. And so, you know, I think as young people are thinking about careers and thinking about where the opportunities lie, I think having a lens towards you know the dispersed economy and the evolution of the dispersed economy, which again is one of these things that was happening in the world, but I think the pandemic really accelerated it. So just to use, you know, a really basic example is sort of watching movies, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, um, people were still going to movie cinemas, but in the background, people like Netflix and Disney Plus were starting to roll out streaming capabilities. What you've seen is a dramatic reduction in the number of the amount of foot traffic in the cinemas, but the subscribership of Netflix and Disney Plus and these other streaming services has just gone through the roof. All of these things, I think, are all part of the dispersed economy. And I think what you don't want to do is you're sort of thinking about where, to, where you want to take your career is to find yourself um, in the middle of a supply chain. Um, but rather you want to be sort of at the at, at either end of that supply chain, mm -hmm. um, you know, either the last mile logistics or sort of in the creation of the of the um, of the core value proposition in the first instance, um, and I think we've seen that throughout. It's all you know happening in in the banking industry as well. It worries me a little bit your comments there about you know online learning, particularly universities, and certainly a lot of universities in Australia moved to online. And, and I really felt for the first year students last year because university yeah. first year is, is a great year. You, you've almost like a rite yeah. of passage now. Uh, and yeah. one thing we did notice that uh, they didn't really enjoy the online learning. And even our students, when we were in isolation for five weeks, uh, the kids, interestingly, when we surveyed them when they came back, they learnt more than they might have done while they were at school because of the online yeah. systems that we had put in place at St Paul's School. But when they came back, they actually said they really missed school and would rather be here, and rather be here because of the social interaction, uh, the direct yep. feedback yep. from teachers, the instantaneous uh, opportunities to interact with people and get that feedback. So I guess just because we can uh, and those realisations that uh, we can actually work from home and change the way we, we, we do work, should we actually do that? Yeah, And that's an interesting proposition for an educator is what is the, the role of education these days moving into a world that is going to be very different? Is it about knowledge acquisition or is it about those soft skills, the dispositions, the yep. our humanity, you know, how we interact with each other and, and look to make uh, the world a better place in which we live? Yeah, any comments on that, those sorts of yeah. thoughts? Uh, yeah, look, I think, I think it's a very interesting set of questions, Paul. And look, you know, one of the things that I um, do worry a little bit about the dispersed economy and to your point about people sort of being educated from their homes as opposed to the experience of going to lectures and what have you is there is sort of an isolation aspect to it. Um, and I think one of the things that also drives the dispersed economy a little bit in the United States is, you know, this sort of security element and sort of, you know, your home becomes your castle, becomes your fort. And I think there there is a part of that about people mm. sort of... Um, Increasingly, sort of uh, shrinking back into their um, primary yeah. 
for residents. And, and I don't think that's good for society at all. I mean, I think that, you know, people's ability to sort of empathise with their neighbours and communicate with their neighbours, I think, is a very important part of what society is. So there are aspects of this dispersed economy and the points that you're raising, which which do trouble me. And I don't think they are good for, uh, you know, sort of a well-functioning society. I think what's going to be really interesting as an indicator is the rental space in CBDs. As you talk about people working from home more, and that's more than likely going to be a continuing yeah. change, is what's going to happen to CBDs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the spaces that we built for work are, are going to be have to be transformed. Are, are CBDs yeah. going to become you know, quiet? Uh, will you, New York actually sleep during the night? Yeah. Or will it, will it become yeah, the life I think it's an excellent point, Paul. And I think what what you're going to see, I think, is um, people are going to sort of refashion, you know, what they need in terms of um, their their head office, in terms of what it means to their people. And a little bit of what you're going to see that that, that I think is going to happen is, um, you know, just that every CEO that I speak to um, is talking about how they currently have too much space. And that, you know, they're all sort of talking about sort of getting rid of 30, 40 percent of the space they have. Now, you know, we're at this point and we're at this point in the pandemic and maybe that will change as people start to come back to work. But I think what you will see is a lot of um, real estate and CBDs, both from a retail perspective and from an office perspective, I think are going to need to be repurposed and used for other purposes, you know, like whatever that might be, logistics or whatever. But I, but I think you are going to see um, uh, a pretty significant transformation in a lot of the bigger cities in terms of uh, commercial real estate. Mm. I've got a couple of questions from some students, if that's okay with you, Paul. Uh, sure. The, the first one uh, one of our students wants to ask is, what were the biggest challenges that you overcame when choosing your career path? And how do you think those challenge, challenges might differ in the future for young people? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. Look, I'm going to say something, Paul, which I hope I don't shock you and shock um, some of your uh, your listeners, which is I actually think um, uh, when you're in sort of the latter part of high school, early university, um, there's there's a lot of um, pressure around people saying, look, go and find your passion. Go and mm-hmm. find your dream job um, and settle for nothing less. I actually think that puts a great deal of pressure on students and sort of creates a reasonable amount of uh, anxiety around, you know, you know, what, what's my passion? And, you know, and, and, and many of us really, you know, have no idea, um, you know, well into sort of our professional careers as to, you know, what it is we really want to do. Um, and so, I'm sort of, I'm a big advocate of, you know, f- you know, um, find a role where, you know, you're learning, where you have some autonomy, you feel like what you're doing is making a difference and then sort of throw yourself at it. Mm. And if you work hard, throw yourself at the role and you're open to opportunities that might present themselves, that good things will happen. I think careers are very mysterious things. If I think about myself, you know, I started as a chartered accountant in, in Brisbane and ended up in banking in New York. It was not a path that I had charted out. It was really just by working hard at the job that was in front of me and, and being open to the art of, um, of opportunities that present themselves. And so I'm kind of more an advocate of, you know, let your passion kind of follow you and find you Mm. as opposed to sort of go out and find your passion. Because I think what that does is it causes a lot of young people, I think, to hop from job to job thinking they need to find their passion. And I also think it becomes at times an excuse or, you know, if they sort of, they're in a role and it sort of becomes a little tough, it's too easy to be like, you know, that's, this is not my passion. I'm out of this. I'm going to go try and find something else um, where, you know, at times the better thing might have been to, knuckle down and and learn something. So um, I, you know, what I would say to the, to young people thinking about their careers is sort of, you know, like let your passion uh, find you. Um, And, you know, in terms of um, uh, how do I think sort of seeking a role 
uh, today versus, um, uh, you know, when I went through the education system. I think just the, the options that uh, young people today have are so more um, diverse and broad than uh, when I went through the education. I'm constantly in awe of, you know, the children and my friends and the courses that they're doing in Australia and the United States and the, the opportunities that they uh, that that affords them, um, uh, I think, uh, very exciting. And I'm oftentimes very envious when I hear about some of the uh, degrees that young people are doing today. Paul, you, d- you didn't really shock me. Uh, I think it was really wise and salient advice there. And some words that jumped out at me it was continually learn, uh, commit, uh, looking to make a difference, grow, and, and let your passions actually find you. A word you didn't mention yeah. there was resilience. And I, I think you probably did mean it in the sense that knuckle down and actually yeah. you know, deal with the, the blows that might come rather than just opting out and looking for a different job yeah. and a different opportunity because yeah. resilience is a, a great indicator of success. And it kind of leads on to the next question that, uh, another student have actually asked is how do you maintain a positive mindset while coping under pressure yeah so look i um i i just recently uh read a book which i think is excellent by a lady by the name of carol dewitt called the uh, growth yeah. Mindset. Yeah. yeah and so i think there is the tyranny of positivity you know in that you know there's there's it's okay to fail Yes. As long as you're learning from those failures. And I think that um, this book of Carol DeWicks, I think, is all about, um, uh, you know, whatever life's challenges are, are thrown at you, um, looking at them as opportunities to learn. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, there's, there, there is an opportunity lurking in, you know, the, in, in sort of things that may be very difficult that are presented to you in your life um and i think um a lot of the work that 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 she talks to um i am a very very big fan of and i think that um uh the one of the challenges that i think you know we all have is as we sort of think about you know um the failures that we might endure in life that it's um some sort of personal some sort of reflection of our capabilities our prowess as opposed to looking at it as a way to um, to learn and to become more skilled at what it is that you do or to become a better person. And um, uh, I'm a very big advocate of that. And life is tough, really, isn't it? We all do actually go through difficult times and real challenges. And, and yeah, it isn't easy sometimes. But as you say, we can always learn from that experience. And Charles yep. Brooks, I think it is, Road to Character, a really great book as well. It's about becoming, yep. yeah, about using those opportunities to become the person. Uh, yep. And we'll, yep. be re- we'll be remembered for who we were rather than our careers and what we actually did, you know, the type of person yep. we actually were. Paul, the last question I'd like to ask you this morning, uh, uh, well, this evening for you is, you know, what's your two-minute answer on how parents can best help their kids be future ready? Yeah, look, you know, I'm going to talk from a very personal experience, which is um, growing up in the Compton household, um, my father uh, tra- travelled a great deal for uh, for business and uh, would constantly return home with gifts and great stories about the places he'd been, the people he had met. And he really created this real desire for myself and I think for my sisters as well to travel and to see the world and to see traveling as a wonderful opportunity to get a diversity of uh, of experiences. And I think that's what we've all uh, ultimately ended up doing. And I think, you know, we traveled a lot with our parents when we were um, when we were younger and so you know just you know i I'm, I'm the last person who wants to start sort of handing out uh parenting advice um but what i can say from my own heart is that i found um uh, the, the experience of traveling both domestically and internationally was um uh, really character building and i think um gave me a ton of excellent experiences and even to this day you know i sort of i still love to travel i love to travel on business and to um see different cultures different parts of the world different ways to do business um and uh i think that is a uh, uh an experience that i think 
all parents should encourage their children to work abroad, to travel, to see the world. Um, uh, you know, and I, I think you know, I, I would call it a passion. It's something that I'll do till I die. I really do <laughs> love to travel and learn. Well, let's hope borders open up soon so we can actually get traveling again and, and visiting Absolutely. different places because yeah. it's it's something I enjoy, sure. but probably not to the same degree that you do, Paul, and I'm sure you travel a heck of a lot. Well, Paul Compton, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really quite insightful and uh, really appreciated uh, learning from your experiences around the, the change that we're seeing in our world at the moment and how that's accelerating and the impact it's actually having on employment uh, and great advice for young people and parents as well. So, Paul, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Paul. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, that was Paul Compton, CEO of Barclays Bank, based in New York. And what a great conversation it was with Paul, particularly around the whole notion of COVID uh, and how COVID has actually accelerated change even more than what we were seeing prior to that. I really enjoyed hearing his views about the finance world and what's happening there and great advice about uh, educating young people and parenting young people. Looking forward to seeing you next time on Accelerating Change.